This is a recording of Hard Times by Charles Dickens. Book the Third Garnering. Chapter 6. The Starlight. The Sunday was a bright Sunday in autumn, clear and cool, when early in the morning Sissy and Rachel met to walk in the country. As Coketown cast ashes not only on its own head, but on the neighborhoods too, after the manner of those pious persons who do penance for their own sins by putting other people into sackcloth, it was customary for those who now and then thirsted for a drought of pure air, which is not absolutely the most wicked among the vanities of life, to get a few miles away from the railroad, and then begin their walk or their lounge in the fields. Sissy and Rachel helped themselves out of the smoke by the usual means, and were put down at a station about midway between the town and Mr. Bounderby's retreat. Though the green landscape was blotted here and there with heaps of coal, it was green elsewhere, and there were trees to see, and there were larks singing, though it was Sunday, and there were pleasant scents in the air, and all was overarched by a bright blue sky. In the distance one way, Coketown showed as a black mist. In another distance, hills began to rise. In a third, there was a faint change in the light of the horizon where it shone upon the far-off sea. Under their feet, the grass was fresh. Beautiful shadows of branches flickered upon it and speckled it. Hedgerows were luxuriant. Everything was at peace. Engines at pit's mouths and lean old horses that had worn the circle of their daily labor into the ground were alike quiet. Wheels had ceased for a short space to turn, and the great wheel of earth seemed to revolve without the shocks and noises of another time. They walked on across the fields and down the shady lane sometimes getting over a fragment of a fence so rotten that it dropped at a touch of the foot, sometimes passing near a wreck of bricks and beams overgrown with grass, marking the site of deserted works. They followed paths and tracks, however slight, mounds where the grass was rank and high, and where brambles, dockweed, and such like vegetables were confusedly heaped together. They always avoided, for dismal stories were told in that country of the old pits hidden beneath such indications. The sun was high when they sat down to rest. They had seen no one near or distant for a long time, and the solitude remained unbroken. It is so still here, Rachel, and the way is so untrodden that I think we must be the first who have been here all the summer. As Sissy said it, her eyes were attracted by another of those rotten fragments of fence upon the ground. She got up to look at it, and yet I don't know. This has not been broken very long. The wood is quite fresh where it gave way. Here are footsteps, too. Oh, Rachel. She ran back and caught her round the neck. Rachel had already started up. What is the matter? I don't know. There is a hat lying in the grass. They went forward together. Rachel took it up, shaking from head to foot. She broke into a passion of tears and lamentations. Stephen Blackpool was written in his own hand on the inside. Oh, the poor lad, the poor lad. He has been made away with. He is lying murdered here. Is there? Has the hat any blood on it? Sissy faltered. They were afraid to look but they did examine it and found no mark of violence inside or out. It had been lying there some days, for rain and dew had stained it, and the mark of its shape was on the grass where it had fallen. They looked fearfully about them, without moving, but could see nothing more. Rachel, Sissy whispered, I will go on a little by myself. She had unclasped her hand and was in the act of stepping forward when Rachel caught her in both arms with a scream that resounded over the wide landscape. Before them, at their very feet, was the brink of a black, ragged chasm hidden by the thick grass. They sprang back and fell upon their knees, each hiding her face upon the other's neck. Oh, my good Lord, he's down there, down there! At first, this and her terrific screams were all that could be got from Rachel. 
by any tears, by any prayers, by any representations, by any means. It was impossible to hush her, and it was deadly necessary to hold her, or she would have flung herself down the shaft. Rachel, dear Rachel, good Rachel, for the love of heaven, not these dreadful cries. Think of Stephen, think of Stephen, think of Stephen. By an earnest repetition of this entreaty, poured out in all the agony of such a moment, Sissy at last brought her to be silent, and to look at her with a tearless face of stone. Rachel, Stephen may be living. You wouldn't leave him lying maimed at the bottom of this dreadful place a moment if you could bring help to him. No, no, no. Don't stir from here for his sake. Let me go and listen. She shuddered to approach the pit, but she crept towards it on her hands and knees and called to him as loud as she could. She listened, but no sound replied. She called again and listened, still no answering sound. She did this twenty, thirty times. She took a little clod of earth from the broken ground where he had stumbled and threw it in. She could not hear it fall. The wide prospect, so beautiful in its stillness, but a few minutes ago, almost carried despair to her brave heart as she rose and looked all round her, seeing no help. Rachel, we must lose not a moment. We must go in different directions seeking aid. You shall go by the way we have come, and I will go forward by the path. Tell anyone you see and everyone what has happened. Think of Stephen. Think of Stephen. She knew Rachel's face that she might trust her now, and after standing for a moment to see her running, wringing her hands as she ran, she turned and went upon her own search. She stopped at the hedge to tie her shawl there as a guide to the place, then threw her bonnet aside and ran as she had never run before. Run, sissy, run, in heaven's sake! Don't stop for breath. Run, run! Quickening herself by carrying such entreaties in her thought, she ran from field to field and lane to lane and place to place as she had never run before until she came to a shed by an engine house where two men lay in the shade asleep on straw. First to wake them and next to tell them, all so wild and breathless as she was, what had brought her there were difficulties, but they no sooner understood her then her spirits were on fire like hers. One of the men was in a drunken slumber, but on his commands shouting to him that a man had fallen down the old hell shaft, he started out to a pool of dirty water, put his head in, and came back sober. With these two men she ran to another half a mile further, and with that one to another, while they ran elsewhere. Then a horse was found, and she got another man to ride for life or death to the railroad and send a message to Louisa, which she wrote and gave him. By this time a whole village was up, and wind lasses, ropes, poles, candles, lanterns, all things necessary, were fast collecting and being brought into one place to be carried to the old hell shaft. It seemed now hours and hours since she had left the lost man lying in the grave where he had been buried alive. She could not bear to remain away from it any longer. It was like deserting him, and she hurried swiftly back, accompanied by a half a dozen laborers, including the drunken man whom the news had sobered, and who was the best man of all. When they came to the old hell shaft, they found it as lonely as she had left it. The men called and listened as she had done, and examined the edge of the chasm, and settled how it had happened, and then sat down to wait until the implements they wanted should come up. Every sound of insects in the air, every stirring of the leaves, every whisper among these men made Sissy tremble, for she thought it was a cry at the bottom of the pit. But the wind blew idly over, and no sound rose to the surface, and they sat upon the grass, waiting and waiting. After they had waited some time, straggling people who had heard of the accident began to come up. Then the real help of implements began to arrive. In the midst of this, Rachel returned, and with her party there was a surgeon who brought some wine and medicines, but the expectation among the people that the man would be found alive was very slight indeed. There being now people enough present to impede the work, 
the sobered man put himself at the head of the rest, or was put there by the general consent, and made a large ring round the old hell shaft, and appointed men to keep it. Besides such volunteers as were accepted to work, only Sissy and Rachel were at first permitted within this ring. But later in the day, when the message brought an express from Coketown, Mr. Gradgrind and Louisa and Mr. Bounderby and the whelp were also there. The sun was four hours lower than when Sissy and Rachel had first sat down upon the grass, before a means of enabling two men to descend securely was rigged with poles and ropes. Difficulties had arisen in the construction of this machine. Simple as it was, requisites had been found wanting, and messages had had to go and return. It was five o'clock in the afternoon of the bright autumnal Sunday, before a candle was sent down to try the air, which three or four rough faces stood crowded close together. Attentively watching it, the men at the windlass, lowering as they were told, the candle was brought up again, feebly burning, and then some water was cast in. Then the bucket was hooked on, and the sobered man and another got in with lights, giving the word, lower away. As the rope went out tight and strained, and the windlass creaked, there was not a breath among the one or two hundred men and women looking on, that came as it was wont to come. The signal was given, and the windlass stopped, and abundant rope to spare. Apparently so long an interval ensued with the men at the windlass standing idle, that some women shrieked that another accident had happened. But the surgeon who held the watch declared five minutes not to have elapsed yet, and sternly admonished them to keep silence. He had not well done speaking when the windlass was reversed and worked again. Practiced eyes knew that it did not go as heavily as it would if both working men had been coming up, and that only one was returning. The rope came in tight and strained, and ring after ring was coiled upon the barrel of the windlass, and all eyes were fastened on the pit. The sobered man was brought up and leaped out briskly on the grass. There was a universal cry of, alive or dead, and then a deep, profound hush. When he said alive, a great shout arose, and many eyes had tears in them. But he's hurt very bad, he added, as soon as he could make himself hurt again. Where's doctor? He's hurt so very bad, sir, that we don't know how to get him up. They all consulted together and looked anxiously at the surgeon as he asked some questions and shook his head on receiving the replies. The sun was setting now, and the red light in the evening sky touched every face there and caused it to be distinctly seen in all its rapt suspense. The consultation ended in the men returning to the windlass, and the pitman going down again, carrying the wine and some other small matters with him. Then the other man came up. In the meantime, under the surgeon's directions, some men brought a hurdle, on which others made a thick bed of spare clothes covered with loose straw, while he himself contrived some bandages and slings from shawls and handkerchiefs. As these were made, they were hung upon an arm of the pitman who had last come up, with instructions how to use them, and as he stood, shown by the light he carried, leaning his powerful loose hand upon one of the poles, and sometimes glancing down the pit, and sometimes glancing round upon the people, he was not the least conspicuous figure in the scene. It was dark now, and torches were kindled. It appeared from the little this man said to those about him, which was quickly repeated all over the circle, that the lost man had fallen upon a mass of crumbled rubbish with which the pit was half chalked up, and that his fall had been further broken by some jagged earth at the side. He lay upon his back with one arm doubled under him, and according to his own belief had hardly stirred since he fell except that he had moved his free hand to a side pocket, in which he remembered to have some bread and meat, of which he had swallowed crumbs, and had likewise scooped up a little water in it now and then. He had come straight away from his work on being written to, and had walked the whole journey, and was on his way to Mr. Bounderby's country house after dark, when he fell. He was crossing that dangerous country at such a dangerous time, because he was innocent of what 
was laid to his charge and couldn't rest from coming the nearest way to deliver himself up. The old hell shaft, the pitman said with a curse upon it, was worthy of its bad name to the last. For though Stephen could speak now, he believed it would soon be found to have mangled the life out of him. When all was ready, this man, still taking his last hurried charges from his comrades, and the surgeon, after the windlass had begun to lower him, disappeared into the pit. The rope went out as before. The signal was made as before, and the windlass stopped. No man removed his hand from it now. Everyone waited with his grasp set and his body bent down to the work, ready to reverse and wind in. At length, the signal was given, and all the ring leaned forward. For now, the rope came in, tightened and strained to its utmost as it appeared, and the men turned heavily, and the windlass complained. It was scarcely endurable to look at the rope and think of it giving way. But ring after ring was coiled upon the barrel of the windlass safely, and the connecting chains appeared, and finally the bucket with the two men holding on at the sides, a sight to make the head swim and oppress the heart, and tenderly supporting between them, slung and tied within, the figure of a poor, crushed human creature. A low murmur of pity went round the throng, and the women wept aloud, as this form, almost without form, was moved very slowly from its iron deliverance and laid upon the bed of straw. At first, none but the surgeon went close to it. He did what he could in its adjustment on the couch, but the rest that he could do was to cover it. That gently done, he called to him Rachel and Sissy, and at that time the pale, worn, patient face was seen looking up at the sky with the broken right hand lying bare on the outside of the covered garments, as if waiting to be taken by another hand. They gave him drink, moistened his face with water, and administered some drops of cordial and wine. Though he lay quite motionless looking up at the sky, he smiled and said, Rachel. She stooped down on the grass at his side and bent over him until her eyes were between his and the sky for he could not so much as turn them to look at her. Rachel, my dear, she took his hand. He smiled again and said, Don't let go. Thou art in great pain, my own dear Stephen. I had been, but not now. I had been dreadful and dree and long, my dear, but tis over now. Ah, Rachel, all oh, a muddle, for first to last a muddle. The specter of his old look seemed to pass as he said the word. I have fell into the pit, my dear, and have cost within the knowledge all oh, oh, folk now live in hundreds and hundreds of men lives, fathers, sons, brothers, dear to thousands and thousands, and keeping them for all what and hunger. I have fell into a pit that had been with the fire them crueler than battle. I had read on it in the public petition, on any one may read for the men that works in pits in which they had praying and praying the lawmakers for Christ's sake not to let their work be murder to them, but to spare them for their wives and children that they loves as well as gentlefolk loves theirs. When it were in work, it killed without need. When tis let alone, it kills without need. See how we die and no need, one way and another, in a muddle every day. He faintly said it without any anger against anyone, merely as the truth. Thy little sister, Rachel, thou hast not forgot her. Thou art not like to forget her now, and me so nigh her. Thou knowest poor, patient, suffering, dear, how thou didst work for her, seeing it all day long in her little chair at thy winder, and how she died, young and misshapen. Along long o' sickly air as had no need to be in an all long o' work in people's miserable homes. A muddle, all a muddle. Louisa approached him, but he could not see her, lying with his face turned up to the night sky. If all things that touches us, my dear, was not so muddled, I shouldn't had had need to come here. If we was not in a muddle among ourselves, and I shouldn't a had been by my fellow weavers and workin' brothers so mistook. If Mr. Bounderby had ever knowed me right, 
if he'd ever knowed me at all, he wouldn't have had taken offense with me. He wouldn't have had suspecting me. But look up yonder, Rachel. Look above. Following his eyes, she saw that he was gazing at a star. It has shined upon me, he said reverently, in my pain and trouble down below. It has shined into my mind. I had looking at it and thought all thee, Rachel, till the mud on my mind have cleared all and an above a bit, I hope. If soon had been wanting in understanding me better, I too had been wanting to in understanding them better. When I got thy letter, I easily believe in that what the young lady sinned and done to me, and what her brother sinned and done to me, was one, and that there were a wicked plot betwixt them. When I fell, I were in anger with her, and hurrying on it, be as on just to her and others was to me. But in our judgments, like as in our doings, we mun bear and forbear. In my pain and trouble, looking up yonder, with it shining on me, I hadn't seen more clear, and had made it my dying prayer that all the world may on come together more, and get a better understanding in all one another than when I were inched my own weak and seldom. Louisa, hearing what he said, bent over on the opposite side to Rachel so that he could see her. You have heard, he said after a few moments' silence. I had not forgot you, lady. Yes, Stephen, I have heard you, and your prayer is mine. You have a father? Will you talk a message to him? He is here, said Louisa with dread. Shall I bring him to you? If you please. Louisa returned with her father, standing hand in hand. They both looked down upon the solemn countenance. Sir, you will clear me and make my name good with all men? This I leave to you. Mr. Gradgrind was troubled and asked how. Sir, was the reply, your son will tell you how. Ask him. I make no charges. I leave no a hint me, not a single word. I had seen and spoken with your son one night. I ask no more o' you than that you clear me, and I trust to you to do it. The bearers being now ready to carry him away, and the surgeon being anxious for his removal, those who had torches or lanterns prepared to go in front of the litter. Before it was raised, and while they were arranging how to go, he said to Rachel, looking upwards at the star, Often as I come to myself and found it shining on me down there in my trouble, I thought were the star as guided to our Savior's home. I must think it be the very star. They lifted him up, and he was overjoyed to find that they were about to take him in the direction whither the star seemed to lead him to lead. Rachel, beloved lass, don't let go of my hand. We may walk together tonight, my dear. I will hold thy hand and keep it beside thee, Stephen, all the way. Bless thee. Will somebody be pleased to cover my face? They carried him very quietly along the fields and down the lanes and over the wide landscape, Rachel always holding the hand in hers. Very few whispers broke the mournful silence. It was soon a funeral procession. The star had shown him where to find the God of the poor. And through humility and sorrow and forgiveness, he had gone to his Redeemer's rest.